How to paint stormy skies with oil paint. Today, you'll need a primed painting surface, a large wide bristle brush, a medium-sized filbert bristle brush, a small round or filbert brush, an extra large wall painting brush, a palette knife, some linseed oil, and the following oil paint hues. This is our palette for today. It consists of the hues Naples Yellow, Burnt Sienna, Ultramarine Blue, King's Blue or Violet Gray, Titanium Buff, and Titanium White. During the mixing process, I also added some Cobalt Teal to my palette. It's a nice warm blue that's incredibly pigmented. Here's my palette all mixed out, ready to paint. My light value colors are up on top, and my dark value colors are on the bottom. Organizing your palette into color categories is a really important way to help make the actual painting process easier. You also want to organize within those groups of colors. For example, all of my cloud shades are organized from dark to light. They also go from cool to warm to cool to warm. This is because as light moves from light to dark around a form, it tends to switch temperatures along the way. And all alone in the dark color category, we have our tree color. This might not look like any tree you've seen, but according to my limited palette and photo reference, it should check out. After putting a very general sketch on my canvas, it's time to start laying in my shadow shapes. I'm using my large, wide brush for this. This is so that I can cover as much area as possible. The color I'm using is the darkest of my cloud colors up on top of my palette the one on the very left. And as I'm painting, I'm making sure to check my photo reference as much as possible to help make sure that all of my shadow shapes and placements are accurate. You never have to paint your painting exactly like your photo reference. It's just a really good way to help make sure that all the elements of your painting look as accurate to nature as possible. Next, we paint in our shadow transitions. By using the second to darkest shade of our cloud palette, the one that's a little bit warmer than that darkest shade we first put on, we can start to describe the way that light moves around the cloud as a form. In other words, this is the color that you're going to use to fill in any rest of the shadows that you see in your reference image. You wanna make sure there's a little bit of this color in between that darkest color and whatever the lightest points of your piece are. Hence the term transitional. It should describe a transition from dark to light. Any areas that need to stay in the highlight, just leave white for now. After you finish your shadow transitions, you can go ahead and use your medium filbert brush in the second to lightmost color for your highlight transitions. This is another way to describe how light moves around a form, except this time, instead of describing the transition into a shadow shape, you're describing the transition into a highlight. Similarly to our other transition shade, you want to go ahead and put this highlight transition in between any of the shadow shapes and the light most parts of your painting. Remember though, we're not going to fill in the entire highlighted shapes of the clouds this color. We need to leave the lightest parts completely white for later on. In other words, we're splitting up the highlights and the shadows into a darker and a lighter shade. So this is the darker of the two highlight shades. As you're doing this, pay attention to your edge quality. Qualities could be a fluffier edge, or a smooth edge, or maybe a rough edge. This is just another technique to help describe form within your clouds. This is a good stopping point to evaluate what you have and make any minor adjustments that are needed. Lastly, we're going to take our lightest cloud color and use it to fill in any of the parts of the canvas that we left white as a highlight. By doing this, you can really start to visualize how your clouds are coming along and the exact amount of contrast that's happening within them. And now comes my favorite part. We're going to use our wide wall painting brush to lightly blend the entire surface. By swiping this gently along your painting, you'll create a blur effect as the paint is still wet. After blurring, it's time to harden our highlight edges. This is when you use your smallest brush and the lightest cloud color to go ahead and harden any of the lightest areas in your painting. By harden, I'm talking about edge quality again. This is when we pay attention to the points within our painting that have a harsher transition into the color next to them than other areas do. 
Now, I'm going in with the second to lightmost color to add some tendrils reaching out within the shadows into the highlights. This is a really common formation in clouds in general, but they're especially relevant in my reference image. It's much easier to add these details now that we have those bigger shapes established, but it's important to go ahead and keep all of the details in your shadows more subtle, so that way they don't distract from your highlights altogether. This can be a lot of fun, but whenever you're doing detail work, you want to make sure that you're looking at your reference image. This is going to make sure that all of your marks stay organic and not too repetitive. Take bits and pieces of moments you find within your reference and add them into your real painting. Now that that's done, we get to go in and blur again with our big brush. Take a second to establish the contrast within your work. I decided to push my shadows a little bit darker than they already were. I did this by incorporating a little extra ultramarine blue into that darkest shadow color. It's important to have the correct contrast in your clouds without getting too dark with them. Even the very darkest storm cloud should never be as dark as the subjects in the foreground, due to atmospheric perspective. Using pure titanium white, we're going to go ahead and harden those highlight edges once again. This is your last step in the clouds before doing a final blur. Now we get to move on to painting in our trees. No need to wait for the background to dry. This is a la prima. We're gonna use these little marks that leave room for light in between the leaves. Painting trees is all about describing how light is passing through the foliage. In order to do this accurately, check your reference image. I know I'm gonna say this a million times, but it is the best way to ensure that everything in your painting looks as realistic as possible. For example, I almost didn't add in those tree branches, but they're really helping to keep my tree look realistic. I wouldn't have done that if I didn't look at my reference image while I was painting. Something else I noticed in my image was that the branches were bending from the wind, so I went ahead and used the same shape to describe my tree in my painting. I also used little leaves flying off the tree like they were getting blown away from all of that harsh storm wind. Choices like these are what add movement and emotion to a painting, instead of having things stay stagnant and kind of boring. I am always a huge advocate for staying away from just adding one tree. I like to add all kinds of branches entering the frame of my subject. Similarly to adding highlights, it's really easy to go crazy with these details, so keep checking that reference image. I'm reminding you to do this to keep you grounded as you paint and not get too carried away. Don't be afraid to slow down. I always seem to have to add power lines into this piece. I messed up here, so I used a little bit of my sky color to go ahead and correct my mistake. That's the perk of using oil paint because I still had that sky color wet on my palette. My most important tip for trees is to paint the light shining through the leaves. This means that not only are you painting the leaves on top of the background, but you're going in and painting the background through the leaves. It might sound redundant, but it seriously is one of the most important tips I've ever received about painting trees. Something about that mark just really helps make the tree feel established in its environment instead of just being slapped on top. And would you look at that, we're done. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future tutorials, feel free to contact me in the comments below or send me an email through my website. And if you'd like to see more of this content, of course, feel free to subscribe. So hopefully I'll see you soon. And thank you so much for watching.